throughout the history of human species, our ancestors must have wondered why they exist. We still wonder questions about our own existence. So there are three fundamental questions in science. So one is the origin of the universe. How did the universe begin? And why are there anything at all? And the second question is about life. How did life emerge on this planet and evolve into complex animals like ourselves? And finally, the third question is why we have consciousness. So we have some scientific theories about the origin of the universe or life, but we don't understand the, or the origin of consciousness, at least until now. And many people still believe consciousness is outside the scope of science. So what is the problem of consciousness? So here I want to illustrate the problem of consciousness by taking an example of human vision. So if we look at a red rose like this, then the light reflected on the rose reaches our retina, and then the signals are converted to neural activities. And then eventually they reach visual cortex and then the signals are passing through uh, different levels of hierarchy in the visual system and finally reach the uh, speech center so that we can report I'm seeing a red rose. So this is all physical phenomena. But what's missing here is our subjective experience when our brain processes some information, we have this subjective experience of seeing a red rose. But this is a problematic situation for science because everything seems to be explained in terms of uh, chemical or electrical uh, activations inside the brain. So why do we need this some, something additional, a subjective experience? So, so that's the core of the mystery of consciousness. And so I want to show you that what we are seeing is not necessarily the reality itself. We usually we tend to believe that everything we see is the reality. But in fact, everything we experience is generated within our brain. So just to illustrate this point, I want to show you this illusion called motion in this blindness. So if you stare at the yellow dot in the middle, you notice that yellow dots in the surrounding start disappearing. But they are always there on the screen. But they just disappear from your consciousness. So the light coming from those yellow dots must be reaching your retina and also, um, to some extent, your brain as well. But somehow they are not included in your brain or in your consciousness. So, so this shows that we are not aware of all the brain activities happening inside our brain. So today, I want to share my view of how consciousness works, which is that consciousness is information structure generated by internal simulation. So the idea is, so first I explained you know, how neural processing gives rise to consciousness, well, that's the question, but what seems to be more important is the information generation process, which depends on our internal model. And also the structure of information comes from the structure of the model we have about the environment. And the benefit of having an internal model is that we can use it for internal simulations. And as we will see, this idea can explain uh, various known facts about neuroscience, such as the importance of feedback connections in generating consciousness. And also, I try to give some explanation or some uh, speculation about at what point in evolution consciousness emerged. So what I mean by, uh, okay, I want to first explain what I mean by information generation. So here I'm taking an example from AI research, and then what's shown here 
is uh, the so-called autoencoder or variational autoencoder. So what this neural network does is to reproduce input images or by generating the same images in the output. But the uh, trick here is this network needs to learn a compact representation because of the bottleneck uh, shown in the middle. So this network needs to capture the most essential features in the sensory data. And so, so this uh, green part compresses information. But once you compress the information, then this network can also expand the compressed data so that once we have trained this network successfully, we can use this decoder part, which is shown in brown, to generate even novel facial images. So, so this uh, brown part is called generative model. And we seem to have something similar inside the brain, but, but in a different architecture. So inside the brain, the bottom-up signals coming from the retina to higher visual areas compresses the information. But, but then we have a lot of feedback connections coming from higher visual areas to lower visual areas, and it, it's been mysterious what they were doing. But it seems the function of the, these feedback connections is to, uh, to generate imaginary, uh, imaginary situations. So, so basically, uh, this generative network allows us to run simulation without actually making an action. OK. And also, in the past 25 years, uh, there has been a lot of uh, research neuroscientific major effort uh, into understanding the neural basis of consciousness. And here I'm showing an image of a slanted post. And there is a famous patient called DF who had damage to her uh, visual areas responsible for recognizing shapes. And so, so she had difficulty consciously reporting the shape of an object, so she wouldn't be able to report in what way uh, this post is oriented. But what's surprising is that she can actually put an envelope through this hole, meaning that she can still use that information, although she's not aware of it. So it seems she can use this kind of uh, information even without awareness, as long as there's a stimulus out there. But what she can't do is to uh, to put the envelope through this slit after three seconds. So if she needs to keep generating the representation internally after the stimulus is gone, then uh, she, she couldn't do this task. So it seems uh, we don't need consciousness for many tasks as long as it's uh, some sort of reflex, even if it involves the cortical uh, information processing. But consciousness seems to become necessary when we need to store information and then generate internal representations when there's nothing out there. So, so this idea uh, may give us an idea about when in evolution uh, consciousness emerged. So in my opinion, self-preservation is a key property of living organisms. So because of the second law of thermodynamics, uh, every system needs to, uh, or for a life system to persist, organisms need to use the incoming information through their sensors and then convert that sensor input to appropriate action to maintain homeostasis. And then there are many biological, many levels of biological uh, mechanisms to maintain homeostasis. So here I, I take ideas from uh, Daniel Dennett's book, and I want to show you like three different ways for an organism to learn the right kind of uh, input-output association. So the first kind is completely deterministic, but, but, but the learning happens through genetic selection. So let's assume a very simple organism which doesn't learn to adapt, but it only has, so, but they have some genetic selections. So if organisms that happen to have the right input-output relationship as a reflex, then 
uh, they can somehow survive, but uh, many of them just die because you know, they don't adapt. And a slightly more sophisticated version is uh, actual associative learning. So uh, let's say, uh, let's take classical conditioning. And so if an animal first hear a sound of beep, followed by an electric shock, then the animal can learn the association and then responds to the neutral sound, at least previously neutral sound, by exhibiting some de defensive behavior. So if we have that kind of adaptive mechanism, then we don't need to die every time because, uh, because the... Um, um, yeah, because the... Uh, uh, this learning allows the animal to change their behavior according to past experiences. But, but this is uh, still not uh, limited because, for example, if we have to jump off the cliff to learn that it's dangerous, then we would never survive. So, so a better uh, and safer approach is to run simulation first to test whether what you're trying to do is safe. So that's where simulation comes in. So once we have an internal model of the environment and the self, then we can use that model to first run simulation of, uh, to analyze potential consequences of your uh, future actions, and then to select the one that's most uh, beneficial and the, the safest. So, so I think this is the moment when consciousness emerged, because uh, from a uh, self-preserving perspective, having this uh, mental simulation is highly beneficial. So, if this internal simulation is a way to create consciousness, then can we implement internal simulation to an AI to create artificial consciousness? And in fact, this approach has been done many times, and um, maybe engineers don't think about consciousness, but it's a very natural thing to do. Um, so, but what's difficult is to prove that AI systems with internal simulation actually has conscious experience. And there's an interesting emerging theory called integrated information theory, or IIT, which is proposed by Giulio Tononi. And so according to this theory, consciousness is integrated information. And the structure of information describes the qualitative aspect of consciousness. But, but there are a lot of critics um, for this theory, and one of the uh, main criticisms is that we cannot actually compute this value called phi because it's computationally intractable. And but another uh, interesting prediction of this theory is that the, uh, if we take a brain and the most uh, integrated part of the brain called the complex corresponds to consciousness. So not every brain activity corresponds to consciousness, but only the part that's most integrated. So in my company, we're trying to find or develop algorithms so that we can actually compute this value called phi or complex so that we can identify consciousness in animals and also in AI. And recently, we have made major breakthroughs in developing the algorithms and managed to compute phi and complex uh, in monkey brains. So, so this is the result. So the red dots, okay, on your left, uh, the red dots show the, the, the brain regions that are included within the complex. So they are part of the uh, consciousness according to the theory. And then, but, but then uh, th this complex uh, stops covering this back part of the brain when the monkey is anesthetized. So it seems information structure drastically changes uh, under anesthesia. So when you compare conscious versus unconscious. And, but, but this is still a preliminary result, so we have to take this with caution. But the important point is we are now developing mathematical ways to compute and evaluate consciousness in animals. And, and then since, uh, since this theory 
uh, doesn't depend on the type of substrate. So consciousness is not limited to biological systems, but we can consider as long as there's information in a system, we can uh, consider consciousness in artificial systems as well. So today I wanted to uh, convey the sense that although consciousness has been outside the scope of science, but now we have been making serious attempt to characterize and understand underlying uh, informational and the biological mechanisms of consciousness, we probably still need uh, many more breakthroughs, uh, new theories, and new technologies to record from many neurons or with, and also ideas from AI research has been very helpful in extending the potential uh, uh, repertoire of theories. And so eventually, maybe sometime in this century, we will understand consciousness more in, in terms of science and eventually change the way we view life and death. Thank you.